<clears throat> All right, nobody panic, but this is actually a sermon. But let me tell you why that's funny. Um, last weekend, I preached a sermon from 2 Corinthians 11 called Fools. And I made one point in the sermon. I only wanted to make one point in the sermon, but this would be part two of that. The problem was, as I was finishing up, I said all I wanted to say in the sermon, and I was worried about how short it is. And um, Ryan sent me a text this morning. He goes, hey, we're having a scene tonight. Is that going to affect your sermon? I was like, no, that's perfect because I didn't really have much of one. So it's a short one is, to, is what I'm trying to say. And so <clears throat> looking in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, where we're going to look in a second, I want to ask you a question first to kind of prepare your mind for where I'm going with this. Everyone that's married in here, did you marry the wrong person? Now, I, mean, I see people shaking their head no. The truth is, is that we all do. When we get married, we have in our minds who this person that we're joining ourselves to is only to realize over the next couple of years that you're not who they thought you were and they aren't who you thought they were. It's not a negative thing per se, but it is to say that as you get married and as you spend 10 years with someone, you come to know them much more deeply, more intimately even. And that being said, They're not the person that you thought they were. They're much more than that. When I married Kelly, what I thought I knew about her was just on the surface. There was so much more there that I didn't know. And that I couldn't know until I had spent some time growing and nurturing that relationship. And sometimes that realization is that it's the best thing that ever happened. Because you realize there's so much more than you thought. And so in a very real sense, they aren't exactly who you were and you weren't either. Stanley Hauerwas said this. He said, you see, in our culture, the assumption is that there is someone just right for all of us to marry. And that if we look close enough, we'll find that exact person. And the moral assumption overlooks a crucial aspect to marriage. It fails to appreciate the fact that we almost always marry the wrong person. We never know who we marry. We just think we do. Time reveals that person. And so while this quote isn't true for all occasions and all people, there's an element to it that is very real. And so keep that in mind while we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Last week, we talked about being a fool for God. And so just for a few minutes this afternoon, and I do mean a few minutes, we're going to talk about what it means to be a loser for God. Both last week's title, Fools and Losers, are not things that we would affectionately like to be called in our lives. When someone calls you a fool or a loser, it's typically an insult. But like all things with God, it's never what you thought. Just like the person you married is not who you thought. Paul says, but thanks be to God, who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For to God we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some, we are the aroma of death, leading to death, but to others an aroma of life leading to life. Who's adequate for these things? For we do not market the word of God for profit like so many. On the contrary, we speak with sincerity in Christ as from God and before God. Christ always leads us in a triumphant procession. Christ always leads us in a triumphant procession. We love a good procession. <clears throat> this is from the Super Bowl parade from 2017. The Patriots come home. And everyone comes to see the winners, the champs, right? There's a parade for, and the victory procession for the return home, the champs, baby. 
And this is what comes to mind often for us when we read 2 Corinthians 2. The triumphant procession that we are engaged in with Christ. This was taken in May of 1945. At the end of World War II when Nazi Germany surrendered and lost the war. This is a also victory procession. But these people here aren't the winners. These people here are the losers. These are the German soldiers walking through the city. And maybe in our minds, we most often marry ourselves to the Super Bowl victory procession when it comes to being a Christian. And not this one. But hear me out. Paul makes this fairly clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, you are already full. You are already rich. You have begun to reign as kings without us. And I wish you did reign so that we also could reign with you. For I think God has displayed us, the apostles, in last place. Like men condemned to die. We have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to people. We are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. Paul says, yeah, you guys are rich. You guys are the winners. But this is what we are. We're a spectacle. We're the losers. We're in last place. We aren't up front shouting victory. We are prisoners of war caught up in the victory of Jesus. And now our lives are led as a spectacle for the world in the back of the processional. Not seen as winners in the world's eyes, but as losers. And if Christ is the husband that, and we are the bride, like Scripture tells us, in the view of the world that we married, then we married the wrong person. The world looks at us. And they think of all the things that we give up, and they go, wow, you guys are truly losers. I think we all realize that the church looks different now. I'm not talking about the way we dress, but it feels different too. It looks different, and it feels different. And not just Christianity, but all religions have noticed a dramatic decrease in their memberships and attendance across the board. Almost 50% of America now identify as non-religious. For the first time ever in American history, 50% identify as non-religious. And now transfer those percentages to the churches of Christ. And you'll understand what I mean when I say that it looks different and it feels different. In 1906, the Church of Christ was given the designation of being a denomination by the World Religion Association, which... As I said this morning, we're, we're still saying, hey, don't call us that. But that's because in 1906, there were over 2,600 congregations and 160,000 members. And then 40 years after that, by the time of, of World War II, that number had quadrupled. And so now we're pushing over 700,000 members. The number that, and that number continues to grow until 1985, where there's over a million members, over 4,000 congregations, and that number plateaus. And then over the last 35 years, that number begins to fall and has fallen ever since. It looks different, feels different. Many of us, including myself, married ourselves somewhere along the way to the idea that we would always be on an upward climb. That we would always be on this, this moving up and to the right trajectory. That we would always have this relevant and powerful presence in the world because we believe that we have the truth of the Bible and that we're victorious in Jesus. As it says, we're winners. And so now we look at the reality of where we are. And we realize that we didn't marry who we thought we did. The truth is, the Bible never told us anything different. The Bible told us it would be hard. Scripture told us it would be hard. Why are we so shocked? 
To follow Christianity to its logical conclusion, we have to accept the fact that we follow a man who ended up on a cross. Why on earth do we think that following him would be easy? What caused us to marry ourselves to a vision of what it means to follow Jesus that only looks up and to the right? What caused us to marry ourselves to a vision of Jesus that our example to the world would be that we're powerful and relevant and more influential? Why would we think that? The Bible told us that wouldn't happen. And it's because we've read scriptures like 2 Corinthians 2.14 to mean something else. And then the longer we've spent with the scriptures, we've come to know it deeper and better. That we didn't know who we married, we just thought we did. And over time, we're learning more intimately who he really is, and by extension, who we are. And in that, realizing that we weren't the right person for Jesus to marry either. And now we have to spend the rest of our lives learning how to be that person. You see, it's not that Jesus didn't, isn't the right person for us to marry, but we aren't the right people for him to marry. And the difference is, is that he knew that and he married us anyway. Our job is to see that in ourselves and then to spend the rest of our lives learning to love him as he's loved us. Jesus already fought the temptations to be spectacular and relevant and influential. He fought those and he won. And sometimes we don't fight them at all. You see, we aren't in the front of the processional. Paul says we're in the back. And we often struggle with that because the world around us views that as losing. And in our American culture, the, it seems like the worst thing we could do is lose. And even in the Gospels, we see the disciples early on struggling with this. James and John approached Jesus and said, Grant us to sit one at your right and one at your left at your glory. And Jesus explained to them that they didn't know or understand what they were asking. He tried to tell us then. And James and, and, and John couldn't, couldn't understand it. So Jesus describes the Pharisees. He says, the scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses. Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it, but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads and, and are hard to carry and put them on people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. They do everything to be seen by others. They enlarge their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. They love the place of honor at the banquets, the front seats in the synagogue. Greetings in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by the people. In Luke's gospel in chapter 14, Jesus says, When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't sit in the place of honor, because a more distinguished person than you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come to you and say, Give your place to this man. And then in humiliation, you will proceed to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place. So that when the one who invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. You then will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. When someone invites you to a wedding, don't sit in the most important seat. The worldview in many places of Christianity would be that we should have the good seats. And that many should become disappointed when they find out we're to sit in the back. That our purpose here is not to be glorified, but to glorify. And so many do not stay in this marriage with Christ. That's why our numbers are dwindling. So many don't stay in this marriage to Christ because they realize that they married the wrong person. They thought they were marrying someone who was going to put them in the front seats and lift them up on a pedestal and make them of most importance. And they don't want to do the work in becoming the right person. And friends, the work before us is not about sitting up front and believing that that makes us relevant. Our work is being okay that we are sitting in the back and then letting our lives as prisoners of war that are caught up in the victory of Jesus, not won by us, 
but by Jesus and then letting that be our influence in the world. The world around us says that makes us losers. They say, look what you give up. Think of how much more you could do if you could just be a little more ecumenical and not so strict in your beliefs. Just think of what you gain. But Jesus says in Luke 14, everyone who makes himself important will be made humble. And everyone who makes himself humble will be made important. In Mark chapter 8, verse 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. And so if it means being a loser here in the eyes of the world to be victorious in the eyes of our Lord, then God help us all to be losers. Jesus bids us to come and die. I ended with that last week and I'll end with it again. Die we must. A friend of my brother has a job at Quantico. He trains Marines to be better fighters. And so he's there every day fighting guys who are already the best at what they do. The best of the best. And the only contingency he has for his employment contract is that if he gets beat, he gets fired. Literally, every day he is fighting to keep bread on the table. He is fighting to keep his place there, his influence, his opportunity in that setting to teach and influence. Just imagine if that's how our relationship with Jesus was structured. That if I lose one time, I fail forever. A lot of us do believe that. That if I'm not out front and winning, then I'm losing. And if that's you tonight, aren't you tired? Aren't you tired? Because that's man's wisdom. And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 1 that strength and power and influence is not in us, but in Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, just a few verses to close us out, and the invitation is yours. <clears throat> Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort of ourselves we receive from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance and the same suffering that we suffer. And in our hope for you is firm because we know that you share in the sufferings and so also share in the comfort. We don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength. And so that even despaired life itself. And indeed, we felt that we had received a death sentence. So we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Friends, the victory processional that we march in is not for our victory, but Christ. We are but his prisoners who have surrendered ourselves to him in gratitude. And so when Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. Now we understand that it's better to be weak. When he says we are humble and yet we boast, we understand that being humble is our boast. And from this text, we understand that when we lose, we win. His victory over sin and death is ours. And when we submit and die to ourselves, that can truly be yours today if you simply answer the call and, well, just be a loser like the rest of us. Won't you come?